Good morning, brothers and sisters. We're a bit light on this morning. Um, it's good to meet together to worship our Lord. I'd like to welcome you to this church service. And um, for those who are unaware, our regular pastor, Andrew, is on um, some annual leave. And we were going to have a guest preacher from Brisbane, Bill Barron's come and preach for us this morning. But Brisbane has gone into lockdown, so here I am. A call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 105, verses 3 and 4. Glory in his name, holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Now have a time of silent prayer just to ask God to bless our time together this morning and to prepare our hearts for worship. We thank you, Father, for being a God who delights in your people and listens to their prayers. Bless us now as we seek to worship you and learn from your word this morning. Amen. Please stand and receive the greeting of the Lord. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We're going to sing now, God himself is with us, Book of Worship 161. Please be seated. For our Ministry of Reconciliation this morning, we're going to read from Romans 13, 8 to 14. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the debt, the continuing debt, to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments... You shall not commit adultery, 
you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have commanded us to love one another, understanding the present time, that our salvation is nearer now, that every day is a day closer to Jesus' return. We are to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ because he is pure and holy and you are a pure and holy God. You are also a God of love beyond understanding. You are immeasurably patient with us because we know our sin grieves you. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves, but instead have discontentment and jealousy in our hearts. We are selfish, putting our own interests before others. We look down on others and have a higher opinion of ourselves than we ought. Father, forgive us our sins. Help us to love our neighbour as we ought. We know by the example of Christ Jesus, who did not elevate himself though he was God, but was gentle, patient and kind to those in need and who came to him in humility and repentance. Help us not only to be humble, but to thoughtfully consider the needs of others as we clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, in, whom no, in whose name we pray. Amen. Sing now a bracket of two songs. Lord, my petition hear and speak, O Lord.
now call on Clint, seat, be seated. Just call on our brother Ed Vanderveld to lead us in a congregational prayer. I just want to pray for some of the people in the congregation who are not well, uh, for some of the people on holidays, for our elderly folk, and perhaps even some of the people in the congregation who were affected by the floods which we remember with 10 years ago today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you with whatever concerns and cares are on our heart. Lord, we just thank you for this fellowship, Lord, for the people of this church who make this fellowship and who love and care for each other. And Lord, we just pray that you may bless this group of people. Lord, um, we thank you for our pastor Andrew and his wife and, uh, and their faithfulness and work within us. Lord, um, for Andrew teaching us and leading us in your ways and uh, for their ministry to us. And Lord, as they have some time of leave, I just pray that you may be with them and strengthen them. May they be refreshed and uh, may you bless them as a family. Lord, we pray for um, some people in our congregation who are struggling with their health. And we think particularly of Steve and um, we pray for strength for him and for his family. Lord, may you comfort them with this time and may you guide the doctors and those who, um, who care for him that they may find ways to help him and strengthen him. Lord, we pray for the Biscochos who, with the loss of their mother recently, and pray that they may find comfort in knowing that she knew you as her Lord and Saviour. Lord, for difficulty for them to not attend to her farewell, her funeral, and we just pray for them that you may comfort them and strengthen them. Lord, we think of... Um, Jenny with the loss of her sister recently and uh, for her and her family and pray that they may uh, find comfort um, from you in knowing that you care for all things. Lord, um, for people in our midst who are elderly and um, who struggle with their health and with mobility, um, we think of them and remi remember them and pray that you may be with them and strengthen them. Lord, for this time of year with Christmas and um, with family and friends, Lord, um, we pray that uh, they may find comfort and strength from visits and fr from family. Lord, for young families in our church, um, with their children, we pray for your blessing in them. Grant parents wisdom and strength as they bring their children up in the fear and knowledge of you. Uh, Lord, um, for families who, uh, whose children are about to uh, getting ready for school soon and uh, still on holidays, Lord, um, we pray for your blessing on them. Lord, uh, for some children who will start high school this year and uh, who um, have a new phase in life, Lord, be with them and their families as they lead them through this. Uh, Lord, we um, pray for activities that will begin again in our church amongst the young people and amongst uh, friends and those who uh, got joined together to have fellowship together, but also who joined together to bring the good news of Jesus out to the community. Lord, may you be with them and strengthen them and bless their work. Lord, we um, remember too, it was 10 years ago today, the uh, flood that swept through Toowoomba and Grantham, and where people lost their lives. And um, for those who remember and... Um, in some ways commemorate. Lord, um, may they all be drawn to the fact that somewhere we will all die and we will be looking for a saviour. Lord, may they be, a day like today, be a reminder to them for their need for a saviour. And we pray for those who bring your word that um, it may go out in strength. Lord, this we ask in your name. Amen. Our Bible readings this morning come from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 21, and 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4, and verse 8. And our text 
comes again from 2 Timothy. Starting with 2 Peter. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that, I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Just as Janus and Jombres opposed Moses, so that also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds, who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. Now, a text for the sermon this morning. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The sermon I've chosen this morning um, is actually a Reformation Day sermon. Um, it's by the Rev. Dr. Steve Vorwind. Um, I know it's not Reformation Day, but it has a, a really good, strong message about the importance of Scripture and knowing Scripture. So... Um, Beloved people of the Lord Jesus Christ, what would you like to be remembered for when you die? What mark would you like to have left on the world when you are gone? What will be your legacy to the next generation? These may not be questions we think about often enough. They may not always be comfortable questions, but they were certainly questions that exercised the mind of the Apostle Paul. Here he was at the end of his life. He was sitting in a cold, dark prison cell in Rome. The murderous Nero was emperor at the time. And Paul knew that his own chances of survival were rather slim. So he pens this letter to his young friend Timothy in faraway Ephesus. And it is the last letter that we have from him. It is the Apostle's swan song. 
And what is the great theme to this last letter of Paul's? What's the title you would give it? I would suggest simply this, Paul's legacy. And what was that legacy? What did Paul want to pass on to Timothy more than anything else? What did Paul want Timothy to hang on to more than anything else? It was the gospel, the message of scripture. When you read to Timothy, you can't miss it. He comes back to it time and time again. Think of the many ways he refers to the message of scripture or the gospel in this letter. It is the pattern of sound words, chapter 1, verse 13. It is the word of God, chapter 2, verse 9. The word of truth, chapter 2, verse 15. He also reminds Timothy of it as the treasure which has been entrusted to you, chapter 1, verse 14, and the things which you have heard from me, chapter 2, verse 2. And these things were securely anchored in what our passage calls the sacred writings, chapter 3, verse 15, and all scripture, verse 16. From the beginning to end, this was Paul's theme, the gospel, the word, the scriptures. This was his legacy to Timothy. And what a wonderful legacy it was. Over time, it transformed the ancient world. That gospel for which Paul was suffering imprisonment in Rome would eventually change the entire Roman Empire. Its influence would be so profound that whole religions would die out. I mean, when did you last hear of someone seriously worship, worshipping Zeus or Apollo or Juno or Diana or Mercury? No wonder Paul was so adamant about leaving the gospel and his, as his legacy. He knew that it was the only power that could change the world. But even a world that has heard the gospel can become resistant to the gospel. Even a culture that has the Bible can bury that Bible. It can lie buried under a heap of traditions or it can be entombed in a language that most people don't understand. And that's precisely what had happened in the medieval church. That gospel had been buried beneath layer upon layer of church tradition. The Bible that was used in was in Latin, a language that had not been spoken by the common people for the last thousand years. The Dark Ages had obscured the light of the gospel. Christendom had lost the plot and was under serious threat. The Ottoman Turks were the superpower of the day. In the middle of the 15th century, their armies had surrounded Constantinople, the last bastion of Christianity in the east. Although the city appealed for help from the Christian west, it was more or less left to its fate and fell to the Turks in 1453. As a result, they conquered most of southeastern Europe and by 1529 they were laying siege to the city of Vienna. Would Christianity survive? Here it was, confined to a relatively small corner of the world, northern and western Europe. And doctrinally and spiritually, it had seriously lost its way. How could it possibly be revived? In the providence of God, the answer came with the Reformation. And at the heart of the Reformation lies the rediscovery of the gospel, the basic message of the Bible. What the reformers did more than anything else was to take their Bible, dust it off, blow away the cobwebs, 
and put it back in the hands of the people. And they did this by translating it into the common languages of the day. Luther's translation of the whole Bible into German during his confinement at the Wartburg Castle in 1522 has to have been one of the most significant events in European history. Luther's translation transformed the German language. It changed the face of Europe and it altered the course of world history. After more than a millennium, the Bible was once again available in a language that ordinary people could understand. Let me quote what Luther himself had to say on the subject. No greater mischief can happen to a Christian people than to have God's word taken from them or falsified so that they no longer have it, pure and clear. God grant that we and our descendants not be witnesses of such a calamity. Soon others took up Luther's challenge. William Tyndale translated the New Testament into English in 1525. A whole spate of translations followed that included the Great Bible of 1539 and the Geneva Bible of 1560. Finally, this tradition culminated in the publication of the beautiful King's ja King James Version of 1611. The Bible was once again available in languages that everyone could understand and the world would never be the same again. This was the reformer's greatest legacy, the word of God in the language of the people. It is a legacy that lives on today as more and more people around the globe can read the Bible in their own language. And it is that Bible that I want to preach about this morning. And I want to do so from a text that gave great inspiration to the reformers. And that was the legacy that Paul passed on to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here Paul says three things about the scriptures. The nature of scripture. All scripture is God-breathed. The use or the usefulness of scripture. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. And the purpose of scripture so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So there you have it. There you have the nub of it, or should I say the nup of it. N-U-P is the nature, the use and the purpose of scripture. Now nup is of course just a nonsense syllable, so maybe you can turn it around and get the word pun. You can do what you like, so long as you remember these three points. If I bumped you into you in the streets this week, then you should be able to say to me, ah yes, you preached on the nature, the use and the purpose of scripture. So let's begin with the nature of scripture. It is God breathed. Now it needs to be said here that the NIV has an excellent translation. All scripture is God breathed. Most older translations say that all scripture is given by inspiration of God or is inspired by God. This gives the impression that God breathed into it. The idea seems to be like a glass blower blowing into the molten glass and giving it a particular shape. But that is not quite the picture. It is not so much that God breathes into something, but that he breathes out. And what is it that we produce 
most often when we breathe out. We breathe when we speak. If you hold your hand in front of your mouth when you speak, you will feel constant little puffs on your hand. And that is the picture we have here of God. All scripture is God breathed. In every passage, we have God speaking. Every word is produced by the very breath of God. It was this high view of scripture that gave the work the reformers, the work of the reformers, such authority and that gave their preaching such extraordinary power. When God speaks, things happen. When God breathes, things happen. In Genesis, Genesis 1, he spoke and the universe came into being. In Genesis 2, he breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living being. And the same theme keeps recurring throughout scripture. Ezekiel 37 verse 9. In the valley of dry bones, God said to the prophet, prophet, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So when God breathes and when he speaks, things happen. The creation comes into being. Man is given life. Dead people are revived. But what happens when he speaks through his word? What do the God-breathed scriptures bring about? Paul reminds Timothy what these scriptures have done in his own life. They have made him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Because of those scriptures, Timothy had been brought to a saving knowledge of Christ. He had learned to trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for his salvation. He had come to realise that he could come to God only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result, his life had been transformed. The God-breathed scriptures had spoken to him and he received new life. And let me quite categorically, let me tell you quite categorically, categorically, the same thing is still happening today. At the Reformed Theological College, we have a residence called Barclay Hall. It houses about 40 students. Many of them are Deakin University internationals. There are also a handful of our own OTC students. These students decided to start a Bible study group for any others who were interested. Since that time, they have led a group studying Mark's Gospel. They just opened their Bibles, taught them about Jesus, discussed what he said and answered questions. It was a very simple method and it worked. Those who joined the group were from a variety of different countries and several different religions. The only thing they seemed to have in common was that they were not Christians. One of the older members of the group returned to China. He was a 38-year-old PhD student and a family man. Before he left, he came to say goodbye and told, me, told to me that he had become a Christian. I have joined the Christian team, he told me. It was delightful news. Here was a man whose life had been changed because he simply read and studied the Bible. Some of our students were kind enough to explain it to him and quite undramatically he was converted. Six months ago he came to us as a non-Christian. Now he has returned to China as a believer. 
20 years ago, never in my wildest dreams could I have believed that students would come from communist China, live at the RTC and return as believers. How could all this be happening? Because of the God-breathed scriptures. When God breathes, when he speaks, things still happen. It was so in Paul's day. It was so during the Reformation. It is still so today. And I'm sure there are many of you here who could testify to that from your own personal experience. So that is the nature of scripture. It is God-breathed. The whole of it and every bit of it. Every chapter, every passage and every word. And because it is God-breathed, it can do what nothing else can do. It can give us life, new life. Now we come secondly to the use of scripture. As Paul says, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Let's think about the four uses of scripture that Paul lists here. He begins with the doctrinal use of scripture. The order is important. Doctrine is the basis for life. We cannot act on what we do not know. We cannot practice what we haven't been taught. We cannot behave in accordance with what we do not believe. So of necessity, doctrine comes first. There is a positive side and a negative side to this use of scripture. Positively, there is teaching or instruction. This raises an obvious question. How well taught are you? How well do you know your Bible? How well grounded are you in Christian doctrine? You might say, but I belong to a church that has been vacant for a while. We haven't had any systematic teaching of the Bible for some time. As a result, my Bible knowledge has slipped. These are not fair comments, are they? With all the resources we have nowadays, that has to be a bit of a lame excuse. With the books and study materials and online courses, that is a cop-out, you'd have to admit. How will you be when you get to heaven and you bump into some of the human authors of scripture? What are you going to say to the prophet Obadiah when he asks, what did you think of my little book? Or what if you run into Jude and he says, I know my letter was only small, but did it help you? How did it help you? I'd like to know. So how well do you know your Bible? Then on the negative side of the doctrinal ledger, there is rebuking. Wrong views need to be challenged. This seems to have been a big part of Timothy's work in Ephesus. Again, if you're going to do that effectively, you need to know your Bible well. This becomes especially important if you are an elder. In fact, when Paul writes to Titus, he lists this as one of the qualifications for eldership. The elder must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Luther seems to have been particularly good at this. I must say he was helped by a photographic memory, but he really was good at refuting his opponents of faith. Uh, Sorry. He was really good at refuting his opponents from the scriptures. In fact, he said himself, a theologian should be thoroughly in possession of the basis and source of faith, that is to say, 
the Holy Scriptures. Armed with this knowledge, I confounded and silenced all my adversaries, for they seek not to fathom and understand the Scriptures. How are you when it comes to refuting the wrong views of others? Could you hold your own, for example, in a doctrinal discussion with a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon? This brings us then to the practical or ethical use of scripture. This time we start with the negative. If rebuking has to do with wrong beliefs, correcting has to do with wrong behaviour. A legitimate use of scripture is for the moral improvement of those for whom we are responsible. Now it has to be said, we live in a social climate today where neither rebuking nor correcting are very popular. You just don't do that sort of thing these days. And yet, if we are faithful to scripture, we should be prepared to do both. If called to do so, we should be prepared to confront people with their wrong beliefs and wrong behaviour. Now let me use a controversial example. In early 2008, the Australian media were dominated by Sheikh Al-Halali's comments comparing scantily clad women to fresh, uh, to uncovered meat. It was a crude comparison and the comments were totally insensitive and inappropriate. And yet it did leave me with an uneasy feeling. The Bible does have something to say about this delicate subject, the way women dress. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul says this, I want women to dress modest, modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. The Apostle Peter wrote to Christian women in a similar vein, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewellery and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. If a younger woman came to your church dressed too seductively, or an older woman came dressed too ostentatiously, would there be someone to gently correct her? When was the last time you heard a careful pastoral exposition of these passages? I'd have to be the first to admit I have never preached on either of these passages. But then I've never heard anyone else preach on them either. Do we hesitate to tackle them because it would not be the politically, politically correct thing to do? Is it just too politically incorrect to correct? And finally, we move to the positive practical use of the Bible, which is training in righteousness. Now, when you hear the word training, what image does that bring to mind? Don't you immediately think of sports people and athletes putting their bodies through the ringer, pushing themselves to the limit and doing their daily workouts? They don't just wake up one morning and discover they are Olympic champions but away from the crowds, sometimes even before dawn, they are putting themselves through the paces, giving themselves a hard time so that they can be at their athletic best. Think of the discipline that it takes. Think of the sacrifice. Think of the exertion. As Christians, can we afford to do any less? Has our age of affluence and comfort produced flabby Christians? Are we as self-disciplined as we ought to be? 
At this point, let me make a very practical suggestion. If you are not already doing it, may I challenge you very specifically to set aside half an hour each day to get to know the Bible. That's about as long as it takes to watch the evening news. Just dedicate half an hour a day to reading your Bible, studying it, memorising it, meditating on it. Let God speak to you. Let him challenge you, shape you and mould you to be the righteous person he wants you to be. You don't just wake up one morning and discover that you are a mature Christian. It takes discipline, it takes effort. And that brings us to Paul's third point, the purpose of the Bible. As he says in verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When Paul is speaking here of the man of God, then he's thinking most directly of Timothy himself. In the opening verses of chapter 4, he reminds Timothy what the good works are for which he is to be so thoroughly equipped. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. That was Timothy's task and it is also the task of several of you who are here this morning. But I don't think we can confine Paul's words here to the gospel ministry when he says that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, then he's casting his net as widely as possible. He is not only thinking of preachers and pastors and theological students, he is also thinking of mothers and fathers, of teachers and businessmen, of plumbers and pilots. Whatever your situation in life, there are good works for which you need to be equipped. None of us is exempt from the challenge of this passage. God is sending us all into the world with a mission to perform, with good works to do. But to do those good works, to fulfil our mission in life, we need to be thoroughly equipped. To be able to meet all the demands that are placed upon us, we need to be equipped. To do the job that we have been called to do, we need to be equipped. Earlier in this letter, back at the beginning of chapter 2, Paul has compared Timothy's work to that of a soldier, an athlete and a farmer. Now I want you to imagine these situations. <coughs> a soldier is sent into battle without weapons. He is unequipped. How can he possibly survive? In no time he will be at the mercy of the enemy. Or think of an athlete who goes in the, into the contest without running shoes. Is he any match for the others who are equipped with the latest aerodynamic footwear? Or think of the farmer who goes into the field without his implements. How is he to sow or plough if all he has are his bare hands? How can he expect a crop if he goes to work unequipped? I'm sure now that you can see where these illustrations are heading. You get my drift. How can you possibly hope to live the Christian life in our complex world if you are not thoroughly equipped? How can you do the good works that God has called you to do if you are not thoroughly equipped? How can you be the kind of righteous person God expects you to be unless you are thoroughly equipped? And how can you be thoroughly equipped if you are not thoroughly familiar with the word of God? 
If you don't know your Bible, if you don't make a habit of studying the God-breathed scriptures, then you know what you are like, don't you? You are like a soldier who is defenceless against the enemy. You are like an athlete running without shoes. You are like a farmer working with his bare hands. And you know what happens to people like that, don't you? The unequipped soldiers get killed. Unequipped athletes drop out of the race. Unequipped farmers go hungry. But God doesn't want us to be like that. He has given us the scriptures so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul left a wonderful legacy to Timothy. He referred to it as the treasure which has been entrusted to you. The reformers left a wonderful legacy to us and it is exactly the same treasure that Paul entrusted to Timothy. It is the Bible in our own language. What are you doing with the legacy that has been entrusted to you? Do you treasure it? Do you value it? Do you know it well? Before the day is out, before you put your head on your pillow tonight, will you promise the Lord that you will spend time in his word? If you do, then the Lord may yet answer the greatest crying need of his church today. More than anything else in our world today, we need churches that know the Bible, churches that love the Bible, and churches that live the Bible. Amen. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provision of your word. We acknowledge the power of your word. You speak and things happen. Forgive us, Father, when we neglect your word. Grant in us a desire to know the Bible so that we might be equipped to defend the gospel of Christ. Grant us strength and your spirit to carry out your work in this world that it might be changed by the power of your word, that lives might be changed by the power of your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The final hymn for this morning is Blessed Jesus at your word. Please stand and we'll sing.
benediction comes from Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Pastor Andrew and you've been worshipping with us today at the Christian Reformed Church of Toowoomba. Whether you're local to Toowoomba, whether you're joining us from somewhere else in Australia or around the world, we're glad that you could join us as we worship our great God and Saviour together. Especially if you're local, we would love to see you. We'd love to meet you and have you join us for worship. That's part of God's plan for humanity, that we gather together as his people and worship as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you'd like to join us, a church that exists to glorify God by growing in faith, sharing our hope and serving in love, then we would love to see you. You can visit our website at toowoombacrc.com or visit our Facebook page. Either way, you'll be able to get in touch with me and find out when our service times are. We'd love to see you with us. Wherever you are, though, may God be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.